It's February 17th, 2011. You've waited all week to see what happens next with Michael and Holly's saga. Careful to avoid all commercials about this episode. You hit play and... I cannot express the sheer joy that washed over me when I first experienced this moment. It's really incalculable. Hey, I'm Chris, and this is The Office Field Guide. I'm reviewing every episode of The Office here on my channel, and today we're talking about Threat Level Midnight. The episode, that is. So I just released a full video on Threat Level Midnight, the film, and that's available up here somewhere, but I wanted to parse out the episode from the film. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the bits that happen inside The Office while Michael screened the motion picture, but fear not, there's still a ton to talk about and another touching deeper meaning, and then we're gonna get down to rating this one. So let's go. I understand nothing. BJ Novak, tasked with lead writing credits for this episode, originally wanted Threat Level Midnight to be the entire episode. It was his intention to strip out all of the office bits. And we just get to see the film itself, which was a bold move. Is bold the right word? So bold that it was shot down as network television is ran by David Wallace's and not Michael Scott's. And generally they're against major single episode format changes. I'm not really sure how out of touch you need to be with your fandom or how dumb you think they are to believe that this would confuse people for more than just a minute. Welcome one and all to the world premiere of Corporate Crap Fest. But, you know, I'm not making millions of dollars as the CEO of NBC, so here we are. The concept for Michael Scott's movie, though, was on the short list of things I wanted to hit on before saying goodbye to the character for good. And thus the concept of screening the film became the crux of the episode, interstitched with clips of the film along the way, serving to create a layered story that works exceptionally well on each level. Admittedly, though, there's not a ton to recap in the office bits. Off screen, Michael confides in Aaron that TLM is wrapped and puts a lot of words in her mouth. Don't put words in my mouth. The staff gather to watch the film, very reminiscent of season three's movie days. Entourage. And we get to watch everyone's reaction to the film. Joy, laugh, cheers, confusion, and entertainment, while Michael watches them. As we proceed, it's clear that Holly, who's not been prepped by the office mom, by the way, has the only opinion which seems extremely important to Michael. As the movie progresses, a combination of seeing Holly's distaste and some snickers during the scar and dance forces Michael to shut the party down. After a brief argument in the annex, Michael pops back on the television while the rest of the TV staff attempt to keep a straight face. Michael then begins to poke fun at his own film, as well as provide some commentary alongside. Holly comes back in, attempts to apologize, and Michael now having realized that what he made isn't great, but it has brought everyone together, and is no longer concerned with anyone's praise, just seems satisfied to be together with everyone. So there's several ways they could have taken the film. Novak's leading idea was a random collection of sequences that were comedic to us, but would have essentially had no narrative framing. More like a sketch comedy anthology film, but probably still based in the spy noir style from the original screenplay. I'm just guessing. Beyond the plot, though, the general argument was how competent should Michael's film really be? With everyone involved being completely amateur and totally inexperienced, how could he possibly pull together something that was coherent and also entertaining? It seems that their way around this was that the general plot of the film is not internally congruent, meaning it doesn't really make sense. I talked about that in the film field guide, but seeing as how this also feels like commentary on popcorn action flicks, it really works on multiple levels. And the confusing plotline also works in universe as Michael wrote, shot, rewrote, and had callbacks for reshoots several times over, meaning that the story evolved over several years, which also works with why there's a lot of tonal changes, genre changes, and just weird plot points that Michael seems to have forgotten. Dwight does not play a robot. Oh yeah, I guess I did let him be a robot. It's probably safe to assume that most of those reshoots and rewrites though, are related to Skarn's love interest. But we won't know that for sure, we get what we get. As far as acting, everyone had to act as though they were bad actors, which is easier for some more than others. Costume design both had to recreate looks of characters to bring them back to their younger selves, most notable in Jim's hair, Pam's clothes, and Ryan's sideburns, as well as 
create costumes for characters like Golden Face and the infamous skating scene, which would be thought up by Michael Scott as director. Set design had to dress up Michael's condo with elaborate decor, some of which is very Jan-ish, leading me to wonder if this was during that phase. I wanted it to be softer, so I had it painted in eggshell white. The warehouse was dressed up with what might exist in an under the ice arena storeroom, which having just said that sentence now, I don't think makes sense, which is delightful. Way beyond my vocabulary. I know. And a conference room is dressed up as the Oval Office. The decision to use hockey as a plot driver works incredibly well in universe and in our reality. And my favorite parts of this episode is watching everyone's reaction to seeing themselves on screen, enjoying the plot twists and turns, and experiencing what it's like to be in Michael's head for just a minute. But more on that in a minute. And while Michael's on-screen fantasy plays out larger than life, I really appreciate the very realistic and grounded vibes I get from this couple's argument. Yeah, you're a real pain in the ass. And I'm sorry I called you a pain in the ass. I'm angry and I love you. Which might be the most healthy way of handling conflict we've seen from Michael throughout the entirety of the series. Though saying it was his lifelong dream, only for her to say you never mentioned it before, does give me some Homer Simpson vibes. March, I want to be a monorail conductor. Homer, oh, no. It's my lifelong dream. Your lifelong dream was to run out on the field during a baseball game, and you did it last year, remember? The decision to make the episode about screening Threat Level Midnight only to have Michael butt hurt, but then come around on it by the end, was Paul Lieberstein's idea. And I always appreciate when Michael goes into DVD commentary mode during the final minutes of the film. We filmed this during an actual Scranton High School hockey game. They were trying to qualify for states. The whole experience just feels like attending a huge fan servicing film like Endgame, getting to experience something fantastically thrilling and enjoyable, but boiling that down into a smaller community, which makes the whole thing feel so much more meaningful and intimate. Having to limit what ended up making the cut for network television, there are some revelations from the full cut of the film that were not present in the episode that aired. Like how Catherine Zeta Skarn passed away. WNBA All-Star Game. We all know what happened then. My wife was in that game. The love pat. Just how long Michael Scranton Strangler scene lasted. The return of Pepperoni Tony. Fat guys like pizza, pepperoni pizza, pepperoni Tony. Golden Face origin story. The Bachelorette Party's Lost Lines, and depending on the cut you're most familiar with, you may or may not have ended up with the Threat Level Midnight song performed by Andy Bernard and the Ferris Bueller tag at the end of the credits. As a creator who also works in an office environment, there's so much about this episode I do relate with, so let's explore that in the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Cap. So like I said, while larger than life, there's something so human about this episode, and I think it goes back to something we've talked about on this channel before. Art is about expressing yourself. It's about exploring your heart, your mind, your soul, experiences, your passions, to hone in on a vision of something you wanna bring into reality. Now, anyone can do that. It's not easy because you have to explore some dark parts of yourself, but theoretically, anyone can do this. But what makes human A an incredible artist, but human B, kind of meh, is a concept that I've always been fascinated with. And the question of why do artists tend to excel in particular trades, but lack in others has always perplexed me too. Like my brother is an incredible artist. I grew up watching him create things and always just being amazed and slightly jealous at his ability to not only see what he wanted to create, but bring that thing to life. He'd admit that certain disciplines like watercolors or something, that he'd always sucked at that stuff and he hated them overall. Whereas sketching and charcoal things were stuff he excelled in. Then he got all into photography and he was amazing at it. Then he got all into special effects and now he makes cool AAA video games and I kinda hate him. Okay, not really, I don't hate him, but I'm getting off point. I think of art as the marriage of vision and skills. And people work their entire lives honing in and perfecting techniques to allow them to craft things into reality that was previously only in their heads. It's something that, as far as I know, separates us from everything else on this planet. Some art is meant to make money, and that's generally what we call soulless. And that's because art is an expression of our thoughts, our emotions, a message that we want to give out, controversial or not. 
But no matter how that message is received by audiences, the experience of creating art is extremely personal and a vulnerable happening. And that's because truly creating is always a risky undertaking. It leaves you unguarded and lights up your weak points for others, like in a video game, for them to attack you by. I have loved making this series. I have like 50 more of these office field guides to go, which puts me at concluding this journey around this time next year, depending on how many weeks I skip in between videos. But to say that I have come through this trek unscathed would be wrong. Now, comments are one thing because I have always had the outlook that the internet's gonna internet and a video that took me 10 or more hours to write, film and edit, it gets trashed in the comments by someone who took 30 seconds to concoct their stance, probably shouldn't be given the same weight as real constructive compliments. You said constructive compliments, that doesn't make any sense. Stats though, man, the, the data talks. It is like a mirror being held up right in front of you, exposing flaws that in your heart of hearts, you've never once spoken out into the ether about you. And talk is cheap, but data is cold and a calculated summation of how people actually engage with your content. What it says is pretty straightforward. What it means is pretty damning. And that's when the questions and the self-doubt starts. And that cycle of validation seeking is what can drive artists to quit or just move on to soulless money-making endeavors that can relieve them of any of those questions. So if you watch my field guide on the film itself, it's clear why Michael is so wound up about the audience's reception to Threat Level Midnight. It's not just a cheesy low budget flick that represents his ability to bring a vision to life. It's also his heart and his soul and his life. It's all inextricably joined with the film itself. To not appreciate Threat Level Midnight is to not appreciate Michael Scott. Considering that the only other time that The Office directly dealt with this concept is in season three with Pam. After having her art dumped on by Oscar's boyfriend, Motel art. Michael stands there in complete awe. I am really proud of you. I mean, it's watercoloring of a stapler and an office building, but Michael sees past all of that. I think he gets that this work is an extension of Pam herself. She took her own experiences and brought them into the physical world, and he's just amazed by that. And it's truly a pivotal moment in their relationship. I hate that I just used the word relationship. Which while maybe Pam was just being drunk with office admin power. Thanks, mom. I think she does this little speech here because she does want to protect Michael's heart from being hurt by people. This isn't a performance review. This isn't a grade on a history exam. This is a piece of work which is connected to Michael's soul, which is why I absolutely love the resolution of this episode. I think the realization that is slowly washing over Michael throughout the final minutes of his screening is that this isn't, or at least should have never been, about him. What he overlooked along the way is that by including his staff, or maybe better stated, his friends, in the creation process, he made Threat Level Midnight so much more than just a film about him. It's a glance back through the years for these people with the ups and the downs that they've all experienced. And it provides a way to compare where they were against where they are now. And I think that's why this episode works so well, that we also get to experience the same things. Like for me, I am not who I was when I recorded my thoughts on the client episode. Since then, the world has drastically changed as have I, both as a creator, but also as a human, which is evidenced by the way that I have evolved, not just in my style when I'm making these field guides, but what I might conclude as a deeper meaning in the office episodes. Awesome Blossom. What? The outcome for Michael isn't praise from screening an award-winning film that will thrust him into the spotlight, and that seems okay with him. Because at the end of the day, every one of those four scene therapy factors that drove Michael to produce Threat Level Midnight in the first place are being resolved before his very eyes. The woman he loves, loves him back. And the staff he's wanted to feel like a family is together, laughing and enjoying something that they all had a part in creating. And it's a reminder to me that that's why I make content on the internet in the first place. It's not about me, it's about us and what we're creating together. Someone on the Discord said they really appreciate how I engage with people there. And to me, that's not a job or a task. It's literally why I do this. 
And don't worry, when I get millions of subs and I'm like super famous and super rich, I won't go all crazy with fame. Not worried about that. But for now, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. Someone threatened me last week that if I didn't rate Threat Level Midnight with a five out of five, they would riot, which kind of makes me want to see what would happen. But before I rate it, let's check out some IMDb reviews because it's going to be fun. Citizen Kane, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, The Godfather, Threat Level Midnight, 10 out of 10. Die Hard sucks compared to this. Michael Scarn is greater than John McClane, 10 out of 10. Michael Scarn. <gasps> absolutely phenomenal. This is the best movie to ever exist. We should show this in schools and art galleries and carnivals and festivals. 10 out of 10. There's actually a ton of reviews like this on Threat Level Midnight's film entry on IMDb. I definitely recommend going through that in your spare time. So at this point, I've spoken about 85 million words on this one episode, and they've pretty much all been positive. So I do have a couple things I want to bring against Threat Level Midnight. First, does any of this actually make sense in universe? Like it's a little blurry when the office staff maybe got on Michael's side. The earliest I can for sure tell is season three's women's appreciation. But I know that there was this transformation that slowly began in season two's Dundee. But mid to late season two, people were still at best indifferent with Michael. On top of that, we know that these sequences were filmed when Pam and Roy were still together which puts the filming of this sequence at least before season three, which I would argue is before most of the staff is on board enough to be a part of a Michael Scott flick. I'm pretty sure that I read Novak wrote out detailed reasoning for why everyone signed on to do the film, most of which didn't make it to screen. Money. Personally, I give this inconsistency a little bit of a pass because in my experience, people are a little unpredictable about when and why they would sign up for a project like this. The other criticism I see a lot is that the cinematography of the film is just too good for anything Michael could produce at the time. But I don't really think that's a valid criticism. I think it's entirely possible that Michael befriended enough of the doc crew to get their buy-in, and that's why the audio and the video is so clean and clear. Better question people should be asking is, could Michael Scott actually afford a PC that could handle the intense processing required to edit high fidelity footage together like this? but I actually think that's already been answered in the universe too. This scary black bar is what you spend on things that no one ever, ever needs, like multiple magic sets. And look, I know I've been pedantic in some of these past episodes about some of the inconsistencies the office has had in later season storytelling, but Threat Level Midnight is a love letter to us. And I think it's intended for us to be read through that lens. So rating this, it's an easy five out of five. Like, easy. No context. Return to sender. Clean up on aisle five. <laughs> Episodes like Threat Level Midnight manage to cobble together fan service, tributes to our characters, writing that stokes the imagination, and the audiences that then dream up their own backstories for these things. For me, I would have loved an episode dedicated to the filming of Threat Level Midnight, maybe somewhere back in season four. It would be fantastic, but it lives on in my memory as something that could have happened. Threat Level Midnight is not just great because it's a self-contained package of awesome, which it is, but because it's built on years of character development, which makes the payoff feel so much more rewarding to us as viewers, but that's all I have to say about Threat Level Midnight, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. We are in the Michael Scott home stretch here. Now, if you have some thoughts about Michael's story arc that you would like to share and maybe have end up in the Goodbye Michael Field Guide, check out the Discord or email your thoughts directly to my email address. I'll put it in the description. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.